Our service continues on page two with the penitential order. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Hear the commandments of God, of God to his people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not make for yourself any idol. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not invoke with malice the name of the Lord your God. Amen. Lord have mercy. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Amen. Lord have mercy. Honor your father and your mother. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not commit murder. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not commit adultery. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not steal. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not be a false witness. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Amen. Lord have mercy. Jesus said the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen.
no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body, and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us be seated to listen to the lessons from Holy Scripture. The first reading is a reading from the book of, of it says Exodus, but it's Genesis. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents, to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slaves, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male, or female, slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Let us, by alternating verses, read together Psalm 19. We'll begin on this side. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day tells his tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun, it comes, it comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edges of the heavens and runs about to the end of the end. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just the commandment of the Lord is clear, and it is light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than gold, more than the much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the home. By them also is your servant enlightened. And in keeping them, there is great reward. Who can tell how often the events cleanse me from my secret faults? Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. 
The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we would proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ.
And no, you don't have to say that you missed me. I know you enjoyed Mother May. But I was at something called Curcio. Uh, Thursday through Sunday, we were up at a place called Whispering Winds uh, Campground in Julian. It's owned by the Roman Catholic Church. And Curcio is a movement, a renewal movement that's been part of the church for about 80 years now. It means short course in Christianity. It started in post-World War II Spain. Uh, this sounds hard to believe, but uh, men came back from World War II and were pretty discouraged with humanity and, uh, and with God. And so uh, their wives would go to church and they would uh, stand outside and smoke and not go into church. They would tell tales and have coffees and. And uh, so the church developed this, uh, this short course in Christianity specifically to remind men of how good God is and how much they are loved by God. This Whispering Winds camp was, was the first time we'd used that, but uh, it had uh, signs all over it from uh, various donors and, and uh, the generous thousands of people who have given to make the camp and maintain it. The one that was most interesting to me was the, the plaque um, to Mama Gio and G-H-I-O. And if you can remember, there used to be about a dozen Anthony's fish restaurants around San Diego. That was the Gio family who owned that. Mama Gio was the one whose recipes they used. And apparently she was the one who uh, kind of got them started with their kitchen up there. So that's a, a neat thing. We had a pretty good fish dish, dish on Friday night. Um, but the chapel was, was striking. It was a little bit smaller than our building here. Didn't have an organ. But the, uh, the altar and the lectern were made from dried and tangled natural woods. And then with slabs on top. And they were just beautiful. But even more striking than that was the wall behind the altar. It was uh, sandstone. Uh, at least that's what I would call it, but slabs. And there was uh, um, grout in between the, the slabs. And in the grout were stuck hundreds of little pieces of paper. And it immediately brought to mind uh, the, the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. And uh, I, I just was kind of captivated by the we went into that building, I gave a talk there, and, and uh, I just, I kept wanting to turn around and, and look at all of those hundreds of prayer requests and think about them and pray over them. That wailing wall in Jerusalem is the wall that kind of goes around the Temple Mount, as it's being called nowadays, which was built by King Solomon, 957 B.C., so about 3,000 years ago. And when he built the temple, he called it the house of Yahweh, a place for God to live forever. And we want to do that, don't we? We always want to create a place where we can kind of capture God, or at least capture a place where we can feel close to God. We can't limit God to being here at St. John's or, or even at the temple in Jerusalem, but, but we attempt to do that and to turn places into special places so that we can have special experiences. It was in the center of Jerusalem and it was literally the center of the Israeli people who had been before the founding of Jerusalem and all had been a nomadic people who carried the Ark of the Covenant with them. But now it had a place to be. The interesting thing about the temple is that the general populace, people like us, were not allowed in. There was no unfettered access for the priests. And the inner sanctum only allowed the chief priest to enter one day of the year. Kind of an interesting holy of holies. Yes, count this as a holy place, but you really can't come in. Now, of course, Jews can't go inside the buildings that's on top of the Temple Mount because it's controlled by the Muslims. I could go in as a Christian, 
but Jews are not allowed. And as a Christian, I can go to the Wailing Wall and place a prayer request in it. As long as I wear a little covering on my head, which I didn't mind because it covers up a little area that I don't like people to see anyway. Of course, what they give you is not a yarmulke, but it looks more like what you get french fries in. So. Anyway, so Christians can go to the sacred Jewish spots, and Christians can go to the sacred Muslim spots, but Jews can't go to the Muslim, and Muslims can't go to the Jewish spots. There's a reason that it's still a problem in the Holy Land. But sacred places attract lots of people. Jerusalem and other Holy Land cities. In France, there's Lourdes. There are the cathedrals, the great cathedrals of the world, Notre Dame, St. Patrick's in New York City, St. John the Divine in New York City, <clears throat> the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., and Grace Cathedral out here in the West in San Francisco with its labyrinth and its AIDS quilt. There's the Camino de Santiago, not, not so much a building, but an area, a 500 mile stretch of pilgrimage that people walk thousands every year to feel or rekindle that sense of being with God. I think we naturally, as human beings, want to be in places where we can feel close to God. And of course, we know that God is everywhere. But even maybe in our own homes, we have a special place where we pray or where we like to sit and contemplate or meditate. Places matter. We have places where we worship. We have places where we practice ritual. We have places where we do common prayer. And those are places where we kind of think of heaven and earth converging. In 2008, in Jerusalem, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, a fist fight broke out between Greek and Armenian monks. This church of the Holy Sepulchre is the traditional site of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. Here's the BBC report, and I'm going to read it to you. Israeli police had to restore order at one of Christianity's holiest sites after a mass brawl broke out between monks in Jerusalem's old city. Fighting erupted between Greek Orthodox and Armenian monks at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Two monks from each side were detained as dozens of worshipers traded kicks and punches at the shrine, said police. Trouble flared as Armenians prepared to mark the annual Feast of the Cross. Shocked pilgrims looked on as decorations and tapestries were toppled during Sunday's clash. Dressed in the vestments of the Greek Orthodox and Armenian denominations, rival monks threw punches and anything they could lay hands on. The Greeks blamed the Armenians for not recognizing their rights in holy, inside the holy site, while the Armenians said the Greeks had violated one of their traditional ceremonies. Sounds just slightly like the thing that broke out in the gospel today. In the feeling that something was being desecrated, something was being violated. Holy sites breed conditions that are ripe for conflict. These places are contested and fought over for access and control and power. In today's gospel, John tells us there were similar issues. The scene was near the Passover, pilgrims Pilgrims jammed Jerusalem. There was commerce in the streets and commerce in the temple. I'm sure you've all heard at one time or another why there were money changers in the temple. The temple tax couldn't be paid with Roman money. So it had to be changed into Jewish coins. 
So there had to be money changers to do that. There was a service that was being offered. Of course, those offering the service also made a little coin for themselves. Maybe a little too much. Perhaps they were usurious. And why were there animals in there? Because there had to be animals for the sacrifices. And how nice it was for somebody to have some cattle and some, some lambs and some doves ready to be cut and burnt on the altars. But of course, they were making money on that. And apparently, Jesus saw this as a little bit too monetized in God's holy place. And he did some things that I just have trouble imagining. Can you see Jesus with a whip of cords striking at those animals? I'm sure he did it to scare them. I'm sure he didn't actually hit them. But nonetheless, it's not the image I want of Jesus. But I'm probably a little too sentimental. Jesus had to be kind of tough, didn't he? In fact, Jesus was pretty tough. I don't think you hang on a cross unless you're damn tough. Sacred places require decorum. We don't have much of a dress code here at St. John's. I always, in the early days, could tell when somebody was visiting for the first time. They, had, they were the ones with a suit and tie on or the women with a hat. And that's just kind of not who we are here in Southern California. But we also have behavioral codes and regulations. <clears throat> Worshippers tend, if they're physically capable, to stand for the gospel. Why do we do that? Well, as a priest, I thought it was to wake you up before the sermon. But apparently that's not the real reason. It's because the gospel is the holiest bit that we do other than gathering at the altar. It, it's because we respect those words so we stand for them much as we stand for the flag. We reverence the altar and the cross. And I'm sure everybody has their own way of doing it, but most people will at least bow when the cross goes by or bow when they come to the altar and cross in front of it. It used to be that we genuflect. Try that on knees that are in their 70s. Not as much fun as it once was. I'm just glad I don't run into the queen or king anymore, and, you know, as they walk around town. And we kneel, or we stand, and we, or maybe we even sit now for prayer, but we bow our heads at least. <coughs> And some of us cross ourselves at certain times, and <clears throat> some of us make the sign of the cross on our mouth, I mean on our head, on our brain, and our lips, and our heart, uh, just before the gospel is read, saying, may this gospel be in my mind, in my head, on my lips, and in my heart. And we think that good things come from these actions. Sometimes we forget even why we're doing the actions, and yet we do them anyway. I was told one time I had just come to a church which had had a pastor for 28 years. And they, they always say in seminary, don't follow somebody who's been there 20 years or more. It's not going to go well. You'll be there for three years and then they will get rid of you. <clears throat> I wasn't very smart and still can't claim that, but I went there and um, sure enough, after a couple of months, uh, word got out that one particular person in the congregation was um, very upset by my lack of um, doing the appropriate things. And so I asked her if she would sit down with me and tell me what it was that bothered her. And she said, well, you're just not as, as, as religious, as prayerful as, as Father Shipling was. I said, well, I'm sure that's true. But can you tell me anything specific? She said, well, it's really one thing. When he used to come in to the 
we had a Mary chapel. When he used to come into the Lady Chapel or the Mary Chapel, he would very reverently touch the feet of the statue of Mary. And it was just, it just got me in the heart every time he did that. And I said, wow, okay. I had never thought to do that. So the next time I saw the former rector, I said, Father Roy, you used to touch the Mary statue's feet when you go into the Mary Chapel? He said, I did? Oh, yeah. I was checking to see if the key to the ombre was there so that we could open it up if we needed to get out or put in some... I mentioned the Camino de Santiago, and I mentioned Curcio, and they actually go together because it was the pilgrims on the Camino de Santiago, way back in the late 40s and early 50s, who were invited by the Roman churches along the way to come in and rest for a few days and experience this short course in Christianity. And so they did that, and from that, the Curcio grew. From what Jesus experienced all through his ministry, what we do now grew. It's the history. It's the practices. It is all of that wrapped up, and it is his offering of himself on the cross, which we can't see clearly during Lent because it's shrouded. And that shroud will change to a couple, three different colors between now and Easter. But when he was on the cross, he was flanked by sinners, mocked by soldiers, jeered at by passers-by. How like Christ not to seal himself off in the inner sanctum of some temple, but rather to be amid this press of human flesh. How desperately God must love us and I don't know if you've ever read this Graham Greene story, but as Graham Greene said, how much he must have loved us to put himself at the mercy of men who hardly knew the meaning of the word love. How desperately God must love us to replace an edifice of stone with a mortal body, as Jesus talked about in the gospel today. The new temple will be raised up in three days. He was talking about his body he was talking about Good Friday to Easter. And so it becomes a person, not a place, that is most sanctified. How desperately God must love us to pour out his life for our sins, for the whole world, for saints and sinners, and even for brawling monks fighting each other in a holy place. How desperately he must love us to draw all people to himself, even as a murderous humanity lifted him high upon the cross. The words of our faith are contained in the Nicene Creed. Page 9, let us recite it together. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, God not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified and Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Gathering all that commands our prayers, let us intercede with our gracious God, saying, Have mercy, O Lord. For the church, that God's commandments may be ever close to us, wonderful to ponder, and life-giving to keep, we pray. Have mercy, Lord. For the church, that those who will be baptized at Easter may be drawn to the folly and weakness of God in Christ crucified, we pray. Have mercy, Lord. For our divided and restless world, that those who hold power over others may be troubled and transformed by the demands of justice, we pray. Have mercy, O Lord. For children, that infants and young people of every nation may have food and learning, and that they may love their world, we pray. Have mercy, O Lord. For this gathered community, that the solemn brightness of Lent may open our eyes to these times, their folly and their worth, we pray. Have mercy, O Lord. At this time, you may add your own intercessions, either aloud or in silence. For Teresa, Teresa, and Anne. Amen. Amen. Sarah. Amen. 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 Continued healing for Ken. Amen. Amen. Kathleen. Amen. Amen. For Jerry and David. Amen. 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 For Bobby, Aiden, and Mary. Amen. For John, Sonia, and Jane. Amen. For Jennifer, Christopher, Derek, and Ricky. Amen. For the dead, especially those who held to and handed on God's commandments until our day, that they may be at peace, we pray. Have mercy, O Lord. Jealous and merciful God, remember us and all those whom we hold in our hearts. In these 40 days, teach us to do the work of our baptism, and so daily to raise to you the needs of the world. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also, and also with you. Let's greet one another by sharing Christ's name. Peace, Zoomers. <laughs> Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and make good your vows to the Most High.
lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will they were created and have their being. From the primal elements you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, for we are sinners in your sight. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood we are by his wounds we are healed. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you at home, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving. We celebrate his death and resurrection as we wait for the day of his coming. Lord God of our ancestors, God of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Rachel, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives glory, honor, and worship from generation to generation. <laughs>
And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing.
prayed, joining together in the prayer at the bottom of page 17. Almighty and ever living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and for sharing us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses to Christ our Lord. To the hands of you, the Holy Spirit, the honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Let us bow our heads before the Lord. Look mercifully on this, your family, almighty God, that by your great goodness we may be governed and preserved evermore through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated unless you would like to come forward for a birthday prayer, an anniversary prayer, or a traveling prayer.
We certainly will. <laughs> and we trust that you will, yes, I will. let us know next yes, week. Yes, I will. I, <laughs> okay. yeah, I don't know what the big secret is, but I, I said, okay, maybe she's going to Germany for a year. I don't know. But whatever it is, I'm, just, I'm hoping for the best. So. Maybe she's joining the Marines like a rock. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Well, we'll pray the birthday prayer uh, last. First, we'll pray for uh, Jenny. Gracious God, we ask your blessing upon Jenny as she awaits the news that she anticipates hearing on Thursday. We pray that she will be able to handle it with grace. We pray that it's good news, but if it, if it is not, uh, let her see in it nonetheless your hand and your response. Uh, we know that she is one of your children and that you care very much for her. Uh, remind her of that because like all of us, she needs reminding. We pray these things in the name of your son. Amen. 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 Uh, we pray then the birthday prayer, which is found on page 830, if you don't have it memorized. We'll give you three seconds to find it. Watch over thy children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. And raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts may thy peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Happy birthday. Congratulations. Well done. next door today. I think there's going to be something kind of birthday-ish. <coughs> and we hope that you'll come over for that. Uh, we want you to know that uh, uh, we've done a timeline. Uh, Dale New helped lead us through a timeline of St. John's and to see what we've done over the uh, 140, almost 130 plus years of our existence. And um, None of us are old enough to remember the earliest days. Gail's close, but she's not quite <laughs> old enough. So. Um, but uh, then Mary Manessis led us on uh, an exploration of what we have in kind of into the community and what we do and what are some of our ways of interacting and interfacing in, in mission. And uh, it was amazing how we start off with two or three things and soon got to about 30 things and uh, that we've done over the years or are continuing to do. Um, this next Tuesday evening will be Gail Jones and Derek Collier who will do a presentation uh, that will further our understanding of what it is that we need to do to get ready to truly develop the property. And I know this sounds fantastic and it's almost unbelievable, but we're going to do this with no expenditure on our part. And, and that just kind of rocks people back when we say that, but, but we have a very valuable commodity, and it's called the gift of place. We have land that's paid for. We already paid for it, and it's sitting there waiting to be utilized. And we're trying to find a way that will knock the socks off of uh, the community of Fallbrook and uh, cement our place in that community and our service to this community for generations to come. Um, so that people look back and say, boy, that congregation in 2024 
They really, really, really were listening to what God was directing them to do. Now, we have to do a little work. And one of the things that we have to do, and I hope that you will uh, take this on, is fill out a missional readiness inventory. It's arduous. It's one whole page <laughs> with eight questions that you answer on a scale of one to five. Wow, I know you can do it. We need them as soon as you can get them to us. I'm gonna be at the back door or at the front door at the entrance and hand them out to you. Take out a pen, fill it out now before you get in your car. Fill it out before you, or when you come over for uh, some snacks and give it back to me. We'll get it to the diocese, they will collate them. They're also gonna be sent out electronically, but I don't think they have been yet. And um, so uh, you can do it that way, but we need to get it done because we will report on that and we will then build from that. So um, it's just, it's, it's incredibly exciting. And so I hope that you'll come on Tuesday night, 5.15 for Eucharist, and uh, the supper starts a little bit before six, and then we start the program a little bit before 6.30 and we're done by 7.30. So come and participate for any or all of those parts and please fill out your missional readiness survey. Any other announcements for today? <coughs> Just wanted to remind everybody that uh, we will be celebrating and uh, this particular event is going to be a fundraiser for the hospitality uh, and um, welcoming here at St. John's. I have tickets available in Duddington Hall, or you can go online on the uh, St. John's website and purchase your tickets online. And we look forward to having a delicious meal and uh, lots of fellowship, wearing your green. And as I am more Scottish than I am Irish, I'm wearing a shirt that says, on St. Patrick's Day, everybody is a little bit Irish. Except the Scottish, we're still Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> and that is two weeks from today. Yes. So let's stand and sing. Oh, sorry, Sheila. Okay. If you didn't hear it before, there are lots of goodies in Duddington Hall. Good. Thank you. Six eighty-five for our closing hymn.